kept myself from adding notes to it. <laughs> so we will definitely get through this really quick. Um, I was going to bring a timer up here for the gentlemen who are going to be sharing tonight. We don't need to do that. Just speak as the Spirit leads. Everyone here tonight is uh, part of the church, and we don't have anywhere to rush off to, so I'm very excited. Uh, so without further ado here, uh, tonight the brief message I want to share is called Entering into a Curse. And then the sub... Uh, title is Christ is the Cure. This is uh, from Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 29, our headline verse, Nehemiah 10, 29. It reads, they clave to their brethren. So this is who you're supposed to wrap your arms around to be close with. They're nobles and enter into a curse and into an oath. So there we have uh, a parallel here of the Bible describing itself. So the curse into an oath What's it all about? Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 29. To walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, Moses, the servant of God, and to observe to do all the commandments of the Lord, our God, and his judgments and his statutes. There's a whole lot going on with that verse. But the thing that I want to focus on this evening is that the Bible and Nehemiah describes this as a curse. The first thing I thought without trying to plant any seeds into your own minds this evening, is why on earth would it be a curse to follow God, to do his commandments? Well, I want to explain that because it says to do all the commandments of God, which it's not possible for us to do that, not indefinitely, not as people still wrapped in this sinful flesh. So I'm going to share five very brief points, and as a matter of fact, to keep them brief, I'm just going to make the point and read the scripture. It's going to be sort of a back and forth. But I do want to set this up right. So um, here's what we have to look forward to. It's the five S's. My list originally started out with three, and then I forgot the two most important, which we'll end with. So what do we really have to be thankful for? What do I have to be thankful for? It's scripture, a sound mind, the saints, each other, shepherds, plural, because we have our, the shepherd of our church, Pastor Tim, and then we have the main shepherd, the good shepherd of Jesus Christ. And then to wrap things all up, Man, I'd be making a pretty big folly if I didn't finish up with the best S, salvation. And so that's what we're going to talk about this evening. And we are going to bulldoze through these things. There's a whole lot more that we could dig into and excavate. But um, just by way of introduction, we see thankfulness perfectly described. Where else? Colossians 3.17. So, I didn't do a quick, quick reference on my Bible. Turn with me, if you would, to Colossians 3.17. This is going to give us some, some more body to that context. We've got the skeleton. We've got the verse from Nehemiah chapter 10. Let's read uh, verse 17 from Colossians chapter 3. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, that's really all-encompassing. The only thing it doesn't cover here is our thoughts. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Once again, I mean, we could... Just take the rest of today and Sunday and probably five Sundays in the future and unpackage this one verse. Um, modalism, the whole, uh, you know, taking the Trinity and boiling it down to just God being one person in three parts. Well, that refutes it. Um, but here's what I want to focus on, that parallel of all and then really being juxtaposed by what we just read in Nehemiah chapter 9 of all, doing all the commandments, or as we read here in verse 17, all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Colossians 3.17 is just going to layer on top of this cake that we're making. And so, uh, oh, I, I actually did make notes here. I didn't have to turn, turn there. But So it's, it's commanding us to do all in the name of Jesus who was sent to us by God. So since we can only be adopted by God through his son, that's it. There's no other name. Our gratitude extends Godward via the mediator and our savior. I feel like this is something that we're really comfortable with, we understand that doctrine, it's self-explanatory, right? You don't need anyone to explain it to you. But a lot of times I lose the grasp of who we are and the economy of the Trinity, that our salvation comes through Jesus. Our prayer is then sort of editorialized by Jesus to God in case we pray amiss. He's going to take it. He's going to highlight some things, scratch some things out and proofread it. And I think that's really cool because no matter what's going on, Jesus is looking out for us 
because we have an accuser who is always accusing us. So we need to be very, very diligent. Then we read with further contextual contracts, uh, contrast to Nehemiah's reference that we just read, that God's commandments are also a blessing. So they're not just a curse. The whole point of this, the title might have been a little bit grabby, thinking that we're entering into a curse to try to be obedient to God. Well, it certainly isn't, because once again, the Bible defines itself. You just have to keep reading. So it's also a blessing. The blessing come not by knowing them only, the commandments, but in doing them, taking action behind that. So remember, a blessing is an outpouring of God's abundance, because he doesn't have like a limited bank account. And whether it's Bill Gates or Ted Turner or any of these people, these billionaires, he doesn't have a limited bank account. He can't, it's not like he can only give out so much grace, so much forgiveness, so much of his riches from his kingdom, because that account just keeps replenishing. He's eternal. And I like to think of it that way, because the blessing being an outpouring of God's generosity should never be confused with salvation, because the two are different. So the reason why I point that out, and just to pause there, is because a lot of people will take these verses thinking, well, if I just do everything that God wants me to, statutes, judgments, commandments, the law, everything, well, then I can earn my own way to heaven. You guys can take the easy way and you can just receive grace through faith um, uh, by God's grace, but I want to work for it because I want to be on an even kill with God. That's faulty reasoning and, and horrible thinking. The last verse that we'll look at tonight as I wrap up um, the introduction, and then like I said, just five verses, boom, boom, boom. Scripture, sound mind, saints, shepherds, salvation. Deuteronomy 11, two verses, verses 27 and 28. Um, please go there with me this evening. Behold, Deuteronomy 11, 27, 28. I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. We're seeing the same wording used. I found this by accident, quote unquote. We know that there are no accidents, but this verse was new to me. It was edifying to me, and I, I found it. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. Verse 28. And a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods, which ye have not known. Bible also refers to those as strange gods. They set up altars, groves, and of course we know those need knocked down. Not only in our Christian life, um, practically speaking, but literally back during these days, they need to knock down with a sledgehammer. So scripture, getting into my five S's here, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction and in righteousness. A sound mind. This is so important because we can have scripture. We can come to wildly different conclusions if we don't have a sound mind. First John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. This was as true as it was somewhat 3,000 years ago as it is today. As a matter of fact, it's more applicable today. Number three, the saints. First Corinthians 1, 10 says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye speak, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, this is cool, kind of coming off the hills of point two, and in the same judgment. God judges righteously. We can see how he does it. We should follow that pattern as always. Number four, shepherds both the pastor and the good shepherd of, of any local church independently and Jesus Christ. John 10, 14 says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. God knows us and am known of mine. We know God. That's it. Let's wrap this up with salvation. The best part of it all, that big gift that we get to unwrap once and it just keeps giving. So as we read earlier in Deuteronomy 11, the wilderness wandering Israelites blessing wasn't salvation, but rather a place of rest and an earthly home God desired for them to inhabit. It took them 40 years to get there, and then they still never really did. Romans 10.9 says that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart 
that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's it. Two ingredients and you got yourself a, a soup going on. So we, we have to call. That's the action we spoke about earlier when we kicked off and believe in the heart. So it's our thoughts and our deeds. Really cool how we round third and just bring it all back full circle. I'll close with this. Although we have an abundance to be thankful for, our thankfulness should not never be predicated upon abundance. So we have a lot to be thankful for, but we, should, we shouldn't only be thankful when we have a lot of it. That's not where our thankfulness comes from. Be thankful in all things, all ways.